Hello, um, my name is James Holt and I am Chair of Freedom Declared Foundation. Uh, Freedom Declared Foundation is a UK-based charity which champions the right of everyone to freedom of thought, conscience, religion and belief. We provide research, information, educational and training resources and are the only UK charity on freedom of religion or belief founded and governed by people of various faiths or those who hold no faith. We are available on Twitter at Freedom Declared and all other social media platforms. In this series of interviews titled State of the Nation, Freedom of Religion or Belief in the United Kingdom, our aim is to gather first-hand evidence to understand people's perception of freedom of religion or belief in the UK. We aim to understand what people believe freedom of religion or belief means and how this compares to international obligations the UK signed up to. We also aim to understand if people believe the UK is living up to its international obligations, and if not, where is it falling short? We're very pleased today to be joined by Stephen Evans. Stephen is the Chief Executive of the UK National Secular Society, a non-profit that campaigns for the separation of religion and state and equal respect for everyone's rights so that no one is either disadvantaged or advantaged on account of their beliefs. So thank you for joining me today, Stephen. And we'll start with just a very straightforward question. What is your definition of freedom of religion or belief? Hi, uh, good to be with you. Uh, well, for me, uh, I suppose it's a principle uh, that along with the right to freedom of expression gives us all the maximum amount of freedom possible uh, to, to simply be ourselves. So the freedom to believe whatever we want, to be religious, to be not religious, uh, to change our religion, to practice whatever religion we want, uh, to worship or manifest our religion or belief, however we want, provided, of course, that we're not harming or encroaching upon the rights and freedoms of others. And I'm, I'm very glad, James, that you're calling it freedom of religion or belief, um, because I think the term terminology here is quite important, because too often in the past, I think we've heard about religious freedom, which I think can lead to a real misunderstanding about what this right is really all about. So religious freedom sounds like it's something that perhaps exclu exclusively protects religious people and religious practices. Uh, whilst on the other hand, I think freedom of religion or belief, it sounds more inclusive, uh, more balanced, and I think it more accurately reflects that this is a freedom that applies to all of us, it applies to all individuals. A few years ago at the NSS, we had a conference uh, which we called Rethinking Religious Freedom, um, because we wanted to shift this perception that we thought was there, that religious freedom was something that only benefits religious people, because we want to promote freedom of religion or belief because we see it as a, a very worthwhile and useful mechanism for balancing competing rights and freedoms and, and finding some sort of uh, fairness in this kind of diverse pluralistic society that we live in. So I suppose we wanted to promote the idea amongst our own members and supporters as well that freedom of religion or belief is a good thing. And I think this was necessary because Sometimes we felt that those seeking to uh, maximize their own religious freedoms to the detriment of others had given the concept sort of a bad name. So we wanted to get across that um, it isn't simply something that belongs to religious people, it belongs to everyone, including religious minorities, religious um, uh, you know, non-religious people, uh, atheists, humanists, and the religiously unconcerned too. No one ever thinks about them. Very few people consider the religiously unconcerned, those of us that don't have any particular religious identity. We're not aligned to any particular religion or belief group. Um, the indifference, if you like, which I think make up the, probably the, the majority of British society these days, but they too have the right not to have other people's religions uh, imposed upon them. So yeah, I think it's a misunderstood concept, uh, sometimes distorted, concept when it's used to defend religious privilege and various harms that can be caused in the name of religion. So a big part of the work we do is about getting on other people. Uh, it's not a free pass to discriminate and it's, it, it's not a license to cause harm. So for me, um, freedom of religion or belief is a, an absolute key aspect of secularism. The way I see it, secularism um, I, I suppose the, um, the key principles, I would say, of my secularism anyway, is separation of religion and state, um, so a public sphere where religions can participate, but no one religion dominates, 
uh, equality so that our religious beliefs or lack of them don't put anyone, any of us at any particular advantage or disadvantage. And the third kind of key principle for me is freedom of religion or belief, the freedom to practice uh, your faith or your belief freely um, without any interference as long as you're not harming any anyone else so yeah um freedom of religion or belief fits very nicely with my conception of secularism um it's fundamentally about freedom it's about fairness and something when properly applied at least i think it stands to benefit uh all of us fantastic thank you and and, and lots of your thoughts there's a number of things whirling around my head at the moment kind of link with the un declaration of human rights which i see above your head um article 18 <laughs> Uh, I used to have that poster in my classroom um, and, and kind of the idea that there can be restrictions as well um, for public safety or, or where it doesn't impinge on others. So that's great. And I, I think you're right. So I've been a teacher essentially for the last 25, 30 years and I teach religious education. I now teach that in the university. And I think when I first started, the focus was very much on religious and religious freedom and religions themselves, whereas over the last 20 or 30 years the shift has moved to yes still include religion but also include non-religious worldviews as well which is I think a, a very important step um, towards religious freedom because sometimes I think I've been guilty perhaps of well religious freedom applies to religions well let's let's expand that we need to be aware of everybody and anybody in in this world don't we in terms of that's why freedom of religious and belief is, is so key. So thank you for that. And, and officially, and there's lots of legislation around it, we look at the Equality Act, we look at um, human rights and everything else within the UK, we have relig or we have on the books freedom of religion and belief. Do you think we live up to that in the UK? Um, I think from a secularist perspective, I think there certainly are issues. Um, I certainly don't think we're bad. I think um, there are many other countries in the world. Uh, well, there aren't many countries in the world that I'd rather live in terms of uh, my, 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 my freedoms, my rights and freedoms. So we're not bad at all. So mm -hmm. we shouldn't be too hard on ourselves. Um, but I certainly think we could do better. Um, and certainly as an organization at the National Secular Society, we use various mechanisms um, such as the United Nations uh, periodical review process to highlight human rights concerns that we have in the UK, uh, primarily around freedom of religion or belief, and to try and improve our record. But certainly in the UK, we don't see the, the gross violations that you might find in Russia, uh, China, Saudi Arabia, and many other of um, predominantly Muslim majority nations where there isn't sufficient or any separation of religion and state and the, the freedom of religion or belief violations there tend to be quite common and quite severe. Um, and, and also, we need to remember there's not a uniform standard of human rights. The European Court gives a certain uh, margin of appreciation, should we say, to countries in fulfilling their, uh, their obligations. So lo local circumstances are kind of taken into account. And I think that's quite relevant in the UK, because here in the UK, uh, we have a, an established church. Uh, there's a considerable degree of religious privilege which flows from that, I think, um, such as the automatic representation of Anglican bishops in the House of Lords, uh, Christian prayers impo imposed on every parliamentary sitting and sometimes in local government meetings too. Um, and of course, we have the state funding of religious schools, which all leads to uh, freedom of religion or belief not being adequately respected, in my view. So, for example, the situation we have whereby the state funds faith schools leads to a situation where many families actually can't secure a secular education for their child. They have no option other than the faith school. Uh, and our research has shown that three in 10 families in England are left with no choice other than a faith school um, or little choice, little or no choice other than a faith school. So that means thousands of families in the UK have been forced to send their children uh, to faith schools against their wishes every year. We have a situation in Wigan right now um, in the north of England, where a local authority decision to close a community school will leave the vast majority of pupils and their families 
with absolutely no option other than a faith school. The only school within a reasonable distance will be a religious school. And that's, I don't know about you, but that strikes me as a profoundly unfair and a pretty clear violation of freedom of religion or belief. Um, uh, of course, we also have a law in the UK that requires all schools to hold a daily act of collective worship, um, which is insane. I mean, most people live in, in the UK, uh, most people growing up in the UK probably think this is normal to have hymns, Christian hymns and Christian prayers at the start of a school day. Um, but it's absolutely not normal. It's absolutely not normal. Legally mandated prayer is highly unusual. Um, the United Nations has tried to hold the UK to account on this one, actually, through the, um, the um, uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child. But thanks to religious influence in government and uh, an overall education system, which is a bit of a, um, a legacy issue, should we say, uh, the government simply doesn't act. Uh, we also see children unable to attend their local state funded school because their parents don't go to church. Um, we've also dealt with cases where we've seen Jewish mothers being chastised. Um, and hounded at the school gates for wearing the wrong clothes when picking up children from school uh, because religious leaders in charge of the school want to impose some sort of modesty code. We see very young children, prepubescent girls sometimes at Muslim schools being compelled to cover their heads, again, due to modesty codes being imposed on them by the school. So as far as I'm concerned, none of this is particularly acceptable uh, from a freedom of religion and belief um, perspective. So I certainly don't think our school system does a very good job at modeling best practice when it comes to freedom of religion or belief standards. Um, I think we too often turn a blind eye to children's right, rights. We don't respect their freedom of religion or belief because that's something else to remember too, that children have rights too. They are individual rights holders. Too often uh, we only consider uh, religious parents or even religious communities, but you know, children are rights holders in their own right. And I don't think we live up to uh, international obligations as well as we could, usually because too often we privilege religion, which I think is what fundamentally undermines freedom of religion or belief in Britain. That's really interesting. There's a number of things I'd like to uh, pick up on that because your description of, of the rights of children is interesting when compared, for example, to Richard Dawkins, who who doesn't like the idea of Christian children or a Hindu child. He describes them as children of Hindu parents or children of, of Muslim parents to kind of differentiate the choices that have been made. Would you agree with that, do you think? Um, only up to a point, actually. I, I, I do think as children uh, grow older, um, as they become more mature, they have an increasing, increasing capacity to make these decisions for themselves. Um, certainly, I, I have a 12 year old child who pretty much knows her own mind on these issues. So I'm very reluctant to say that she shouldn't be considered non-religious or, mm -hmm. um, you know, I certainly know other children who, um, her friends who, you know, are, are, are quite um, confident, should we say, in their own status as, as Muslim um, or, or Catholic or whatever it is. So, but I certainly don't think we should um, put hats on children that aren't their hats. Um, I certainly don't think we should assign religion to any child. I think we should give children the freedom to develop their own beliefs. That's the important thing. That's why I'm so you know, absolutely opposed to faith schools because they, they, they take the parent of the, um, this is, sorry, the religion of the parent and it sort of assigns that religion to the child. And I don't think the state should be in the business of doing that. I certainly think parents have the right to give their children an, a religious upbringing, absolutely. I just don't think they have the right to do that via the state. And I don't think the state should get involved in the inculcation of children. So yes, I think it's profoundly unhelpful to um, you know, segregate children, divide children by their parents' religion and then put them in schools on that basis. But I also, at, by the same token, think as children develop their own um, capacity to develop their own thoughts and and belief that should be respected too. That's why I think, for example, children have, should have the right to withdraw themselves from collective worship when it's held in schools, because at the moment they don't, the parents have that right to withdraw their child. But I, for example, think my daughter should be able to say, no, no thanks, this is, this is not me, this is not what I do. Um, so yeah, it's, um, I agree with Richard Dawkins up to a point. Okay, and just going back to collective worship. So that was, an, an, an 
things like surrounding that. So that was introduced in 1944, from what I understand, it was re-emphasized in 1988. So it does seem an anachronism in a country that is just over 50% Christian by the census, and that doesn't even go into the practicing nature of, of such religion, that everything should be of a Christian nature. Why do you think that hasn't been changed? And how on earth can it be changed if, if it needs changing, do you think? I think the, I, I, I referred earlier to the legacy issue that I think mm -hmm. exists with schools. So it happens to be the case that churches were actually first on the scene when it comes to education of children in the yes. UK. Uh, they beat the state to it. But it's long since been the case that the state have taken over that role uh, uh, as the um, providing um, public education for children. But that, that's really it in a nutshell. I think we have a legacy issue where because the church had control over education initially, uh, the 1944 Act sort of brought about this partnership position that we're still in to this day, where the religion has a, um, an incredibly influential role over publicly funded education. Uh, and also, I, I referred to, earlier to the Anglican bishops in the House of Lords. So their influence doesn't just extend to a vote on bills that go through the House of Lords. They have absolute um, freedom to uh, operate in the corridors of powers. They have access to ministers. And I think religious influence um, is absolutely embedded into the political system in the UK. I said all parliamentary sittings begin with prayer. So, you know, it really is everywhere. Um, the, 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 the political process in the UK is absolutely, uh, religious privilege is absolutely entrenched into it. So I think that's, that's why things haven't changed. And uh, it's just one of those issues that never really gets to the top of the pile. It's one of those issues that I think most people recognize um, is in need of reform, but because it's not the most pressing issue for most people, it just never gets done. But certainly, you know, there are moves afoot at the moment to make assemblies more inclusive. Baroness Burt has a bill um, that's cleared the House of Commons and now goes to the House of Parliament. Unfortunately, it doesn't have government support, so I don't think it's going to pass this time. But I think momentum is building. Certainly, there shouldn't be too much opposition to removing a law that requires schools to hold prayers. It's just, it, it's just, it, it's not, it's not in the urgent box, so we say, so it, it, it's not getting attended to. Yes, and it, I mean, it's very interesting. I can't remember his name, but Tony Blair's um, press secretary, Alistair something or other, sorry, I forget his name. He talked about when he was in government, he wasn't in government, but he was a government advisor. Um, we don't do God. And some, some suggest, certainly in, in the interviews that we've carried out, that Britain is becoming a more secular nation. Now, for some of the people that we've interviewed, that's not a positive thing. They see religious freedoms being um, kind of overcome by secularism. Um, do you agree with that? And, and, and I don't know, it just seems, that, yeah, it doesn't seem so from my perspective, but it is an interesting perspective that's out there, I think. I'm not sure what my question was, do you know? Um. I think it's really about, you know, from what from what perspective of the government making laws are they are they making enough accommodation to religion or are they failing to properly um, consider religion? Um, and I think the answer is that we have most people in Britain have quite a secular outlook. So the idea that you make laws um, based on uh, religious dogma is now. You know, it's ridiculous to most people. So you don't do that. But do we consider people's religious beliefs when we're making laws? Well, clearly the government absolutely does. Um, it's religion is very much in the mind. Um, religious freedom as well, freedom of religion and belief is very much in the mind of government when they're making laws. So I think we're just in this kind of hybrid stage. You know, we're, we're not a Christian society anymore. Uh, Christian has a lot of influence. Christianity has a lot of influence over our government but we have a more secular minded public. So we're just in this sort of transition stage at the moment, I think. I think assisted dying is a good case where um, you can see that just thought a lot of religious thinking, a lot of religious influence. Um, and 
the public have sort of moved beyond that now. The, 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 the public are, are looking at this issue and just basing their thoughts on this, on not on religious dogma, the idea that God gives life and takes life away. They're just looking at it from a, um, a more humanistic, uh, compassionate perspective. And that, I think, leads you to support the right of people to end their own lives in a dignified way. But because we have so much religious privilege, I think something that should now be law in the UK, the right to an assisted death, hasn't become law. So I think religious influence just kind of keeps us, it's very much there in government and it's very much holding us back. But, you know, do, I think the problem that a lot of people say who, who, who make the claim that their beliefs aren't being sufficiently accommodated, I think what they really want is religious privilege. And when they see their privileges removed, it feels to them like an attack on religion or that people aren't understanding their religion. And it's not that people aren't understanding their religion. What, what we're really doing is looking at the balance, the need to balance competing rights and freedoms. So for example, we intervened in the European Court of Human Rights in the cases of, uh, what was it, Awada, uh, the Daily, McFarling, and um, uh, Chaplin, wasn't it, the nurse. So those were all cases where people felt that their religious beliefs weren't being taken seriously. So uh, the daily, who was the Christian registrar, who just wanted to refuse the right to um, perform marriages for gay people, or uh, the nurse that wanted to wear a crucifix at work and, 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 and thought that, why can't I wear a crucifix at work? When actually the European court looked at these cases and they thought, well, if a local authority wants to have an equalities policy and promote diversity and inclusion, then that's a justifiable reason to interfere with this person's right not to manifest her religion by refusing services to a gay person. In the, in the case of the nurse, it was, um, uh, there were health, genuine health and safety concerns about why you can't wear jewellery in a hospital. And the European Court decided that that actually was a compelling reason to interfere with her right to wear jewellery, in this case, a, a religious crucifix. So it's not necessarily that people aren't being understood. I think it's the problem is they're not always getting their own way because we are becoming a more secular society and we are doing a pretty good job, I think, on the whole of balancing these competing, competing rights and freedoms. So what feels like religious privilege, um, sorry, what feels like religion being um, undermined or attacked isn't. It, it is just a sort of erosion of religious privilege. And I would argue that that's absolutely a good thing. So it's kind of a recalibration of society where religion has been privileged for so long that actually to, to recalibrate everything, yes, there may be some things that, there may be some privileges that people lose, but it doesn't make them unequal or persecuted in any way, shape or form. It's just an equalisation of things across society. Is that Yeah, absolutely. It's just a, great, a greater recognition of the freedoms and the rights of others. Okay, wonderful. That's that, that's that's really interesting. And you've mentioned various things that obviously the secular society are involved with in terms of the House of Lords and the Lords uh, Spiritual, the, the faith schools. Um, are there any other things that kind of the National Secular Society are involved with with regards to um, the freedom of religion and belief and making sure that everybody has has those rights? Um, it, it's a very broad spectrum of work um, that we have here at the National Secular Society because the, the religious religion um, and belief, it touches so many different areas of public policy. We're very involved in uh, freedom of expression. Uh, we, we, we were instrumental in uh, the abolition of the blasphemy law and we're still trying to make sure that blasphemy laws don't come in by the back door, by a, whether it's hate, hate crime legislation or um, you know the, the, the contentious Islamophobia definition term and the, and, and the potential that has to chill free speech. So we're very much. Uh, uh, I mentioned right at the start freedom of expression. I very much see freedom of expression and freedom of religion or belief very kind of closely related uh, principles. So we work on a lot of freedom of expression issues as well. Wonderful. Now my background, as I mentioned, is in religious education. So. There's, there's an article that I've read, it was a number of years ago, by a, a lady called Linda Rudge, and she talks about going into a classroom and listening to children. And one of them says 
Um, my name is Kowaljit. Um, I'm 15. I'm a Sikh. Another one says, I am James. I can't remember the names. I am 14. I'm a Christian. And then I am Stuart. I am 14 and I am nothing is, is kind of the conversation that took place. Now, obviously, it didn't mean nothing particularly. But I suppose my question is, from my own perspective, really, is how do we meet the needs of Stuart or or those who are, as you mentioned before, I don't mean they're religiously ambivalent, but, but kind of have no religion and have no desire for such. How do we meet their needs? I know in the education system, but also I think more closely within the religious education classroom, I think. Mm -hmm. How do we meet those needs? Um, listen, I don't think they have many needs. Um, what, what they just need is the religion not to be imposed on them. You know, mm -hmm. those people, the religiously unconcerned in Britain, which I think probably make up the majority of British people now. So these are people that just indifferent towards religion. They don't, I don't think as a nation, we're hostile towards religion uh, at all in any way, shape or form. Uh, I think we just take people as we find them and we don't really uh, have much interest in religion for the most part as a nation uh, until it starts to encroach upon us. So yeah. as long as we can build a society where all of our public institutions are inclusive of everybody, then I don't think there's going to be too many problems. Uh, in terms of religious education, you mentioned religious education. Um, we just need, I don't, to be honest, I don't think the concept of religious education um, is particularly helpful anymore. I think religious education was a subject that the whole um, reason for its existence was to inculcate Christianity into pupils. And that reason has gone. So I think we're trying to find reasons why we still do religious education in the UK. And I think there is a very good argument for teaching children about religious diversity, about the different beliefs that exist out there and non-religious ways of looking at the world as well. I think that's quite important, but I think that should probably take place not in religious education, but in a broader program of citizenship education, where we teach people about their rights and responsibilities of citizens, where we teach them about religious diversity. They need to respect other people's beliefs. And well, to respect other people, should we say, not necessarily their beliefs, but respect other people's right to hold those beliefs. And I think that's, that's the way to do it. I just think we need a secular state where religion is largely um, a private matter for individuals, but when we come together collectively as citizens, we do so, do so on equal status. So we don't have prayers in Parliament. We don't start council meetings with prayers. We certainly don't start the school day with prayers. And we don't impose religion on anyone, but we make sure that we build a society where everyone feels free to practice their religion up to the point where they start to impose that religion on others. And that way, um, people who want to practice their religion uh, are, you know, have the maximum freedoms to do that. And those that want absolutely nothing to do with religion um, don't have to. Yeah, really interesting. Just um, kind of a final topic is, is we've talked a lot about the UK, how it's doing with regards to its kind of responsibilities. How do you think we are doing at promoting um, freedom of religion and, and belief out with the borders of the UK, do you think? I think we're doing a pretty good job. I think we do have a government at the moment, at least. Um, and, and, and I would argue that this wouldn't change if there was a change of government either. I think all political parties in this country are quite serious about promoting the principle of freedom of religion or belief. And I know that we regularly ways, uh, raise human rights concerns in other countries, particularly, you know, uh, well, all sorts of countries, to be honest, but we've mm -hmm. most recently we've raised concerns about human rights abuses in Pakistan. Um, and we have a pretty good relationship with the Foreign Commonwealth Office. They, they certainly take our uh, concerns on board. Uh, we know that they do raise these issues. These, they raise these issues with foreign governments. Um, of course, they do it in a diplomatic way. I mean, diplomacy is a very messy, messy business. And sometimes what's emotionally satisfying for the UK to absolutely outright condemn uh, other countries, um, that's emotionally satisfying. But I think diplomacy is a little bit more complicated than that. So I think we have to give a little bit of leeway to our government to 
to um, operate in the way that they think is the most um, appropriate way to, to go about it, basically. But I am, I am satisfied that our government do take freedom of religion or belief seriously, and they do promote it on the global uh, scale. I think, that's, um, I think that's something we do particularly well at. Yeah, I think you're right. Sometimes it would be lovely and amazing to see certain things condemned just with no strings attached. But then at the same time, we don't know everything that's going on behind the scenes and, and kind of what needs to be, I don't know, avoided and, and everything else to maintain the safety of all people um, that may be there. So thank you for those things. Is there anything else you'd like to say about the freedom of, of religion and belief that I've not covered uh, with regards to secularism or, or with regards to yourself? in general? Uh, no, I think we've pretty much covered it. I think it's just, um, I, I think what's important, I think the takeaway for me is that people really have to understand that this is about balancing completing rights and freedoms. And, you know, whilst I'm all for the maximization of freedom of religion or belief, we really do need to look at it from both sides. And particularly when it comes to children's rights, I think we are, we are too um, willing, I think sometimes to turn a blind eye to harm done in the name of religion. So when we are talking about freedom of religion or belief, I, I think with every religious privilege, there's a victim. So it's important that we think about the victims, we think about the most vulnerable members of our society and make sure that we're speaking up for those as well and not just letting the religious groups dominate the debate when it comes to freedom of religion or belief. Yes, because sometimes the biggest voices are not necessarily representative of everybody or, or understanding of everybody and that's the same with any in any debate as well isn't it so absolutely yeah thank you for that Seema and thank you for your time today um, it's been really interesting um, chatting to you for those of you who've listened um, if you'd like to subscribe we are on Apple Podcasts we're also on Spotify and also on YouTube so please feel free to subscribe thank you again Stephen thank you